program is brought to you by Agnes Scott College. For more information about Agnes Scott College, please visit our website at agnesscott.edu. Scholars Program Group of the Center Planning Committee and Best Brasswick, and also to some extent Pam Simmons for their work in planning the keynote lecture and other events of the 2009 Cardian Program. I am delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker. Loretta Ross is such an accomplished woman, I do not even know where to start in an introduction of just a few minutes. Anyway, I'll try. An intellectual, activist, and champion of women's rights, Ms. Ross has shaped and contributed to a number of causes. She was one of the first African-American women to direct a rape crisis center in the United States in the 1970s. From 1985 to 1989, she served as the director of women of color programs for the National Organization for Women. In that capacity, she organized the first national conference on women of color and reproductive rights in 1987. In 2004, Ross was national co-director of the April 25 March for Women's Lives in Washington, D.C., which brought over one million activists to the Capitol. She is currently the national coordinator of the Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Health Collective a network of 80 women of color and allied organizations founded in 1997 for the promotion of reproductive justice. She holds this position and others in addition to being a doctoral student in the Women's Studies program at Emory University. Loretta's insights and expertise are highly sought after a political commentator for Pacifica News Service. She has appeared on ABC's Good Morning America, The Donahue Show, The Charlie Rose Show, CNN, and BET. To the delight of Smith College, what I note here with chagrin, Loretta's, <laughs> <laughs> Loretta's illuminating papers are housed in the archives of the Sophia Smith collection at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. How could you, Lauren? <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> Can we ask that? <laughs> anyway, Smith's game notwithstanding, Loretta is a product of Agnes Scott College, and Smith cannot take that from us. <laughs> When she enrolled at Agnes, by her own admission, she was determined to connect in tangible and productive ways every course she took to the book on black abortion she had just begun to develop. She was a student in two of my courses, so I know firsthand how she made those connections. Loretta is passionate about learning, teaching, and the many causes on behalf of women and humanity that she embraces. I am happy that she is back here at Agnes Scott as the Cardin alumna to share her work with us. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Miss Loretta Ross. Child graduate, you know, those kinds of experiences. But 
And the Scott probably presented me my best experience, because when I walked across that stage in 07, my son and my grandson were in the audience. Aww. And that don't happen. <laughs> best experiences in life happened on this campus, even though I have to honestly say, those of us who are Woodrow Scholars, we appreciate this education to the extent that I'm not quite so sure everybody else quite gets. <laughs> and I'm not so sure even the professors really like us, because we make y'all work harder than you want to. <laughs> I found that out a couple of times. <laughs> Professor asked me, what would you like the exam to be? <laughs> I'm like, you don't know. <laughs> as early as possible. <clears throat> that was not the answer. She nor the rest of my classmates wanted to hear. <laughs> well, I want to again thank the Agnes Scott community for inviting me, President Keish, all the people who, who formed my support committee while I was here at Agnes Scott. I came here in 1999, graduated in 07, so it was a smooth but I finally did it. Um, I think that it's hard for me to kind of figure out what I want to say today, even though I wrote a speech, and I never write speeches, so that's how much I think of y'all. <laughs> um, and then I need to talk a little bit about the process. I just got told a few minutes ago that my hour has been cut to a half hour, so I might be speaking at a New York speed to try to get in everything I want to say, which is kind of hard for a girl from Texas. Because generally we take half hour to just say hello. <laughs> you know, we southern women, we do it that way. <laughs> and so I start blurring words, that's fine. Uh, but I think I can extend the time a little bit if I change the projected 20 minutes of Q&A and ask you to interrupt me with your questions as we go. And that way I can have a little bit more time, direct my remarks towards what your questions are, right, and still stay within the time limits that I've been given. And that's okay with y'all. One thing I've learned about the Agnes Scott community is that we're fearless when it comes to asking questions. So I think you can work with that. The other thing is that I'm physically challenged to stand here for an hour. So I put that chair out there in case my legs start hurting and I gotta sit down, you know, that wonderful friend of us called Arthur and Idas, <laughs> you know, really will kick in in some way. But I'm going to stand for as long as I can, and if you see me drift over there, it's not because I don't love you, it's because I just can't stand anymore, and they got a whole heavy day for me today. And finally, I don't really like PowerPoint-driven presentations, <coughs> so I only have three slides. <laughs> okay. So don't be intimidated. <laughs> by what you see up there right now. I'll only use the other two slides, because this is one of the three. <laughs> <laughs> so that I hope that some of the points I make can really stick. So please forgive me that I wanted to use the PowerPoint, but in a very, very limited way. I, I mean, now this is probably anathema on a <coughs> within the academic community, but I tend to feel that unless you're doing statistics, when you use PowerPoint too much, it really betrays a lack of familiarity with what you need to say. That's my personal preference. I felt that as a student, I feel that as a speaker. As you heard through my bio, I've worked in the women's movement since 1972 as a feminist. And so I think the thing that most brought me to Agnes Scott was the desire to add some theory to my practice. And in taking women's studies and getting the famous packet packet <laughs> Y'all know about these packets if you have to take a women's studies? Oh, Beth gives you that much material that she personally Xerox. And you end up carrying this thing like it's the feminist Bible. <laughs> and I just got a new hacket packet from her yesterday. That's how important this is. You know, something that I wanted to, to uh, refresh myself on because she's one of the more brilliant feminist theoreticians I've ever met. And I've met a lot. You have a great resource in that. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my present work, give you a little background on the global human rights movement, and discuss some of the opportunities and challenges that we face in bringing human rights home 
to the Agnes Scott community. I would detail five specific steps that I think we can take to make that happen. I think that some of them will be challenging, but I think that if we keep our minds open like the famous parachute folk, we can make it work. I do represent Sister Song, which is our Pascal's parents, which is uh, was said is a national of color reproductive justice organization. We represent African American, Native American, Latina, Asian Pacific Islander, Middle Eastern, North African, white, queer, women of color. How about just everybody? We started out as only women of color, but we expanded because we had such a radical analysis called reproductive justice that other people wanted to join Sister Song. So in 2003, we just opened up and said, if you can speak, it's coherent, coherent sentence, you can join us. <laughs> and we formed this coalition because too often the needs and perspectives of women of color got little attention or respect. And we felt that we joined the pro choice movement and fighting for the right not to have a child, so we support birth control and abortion and abstinence, if you can hang out that long. I mean, we join them in that. But because we're women of color subjected to various strategies of population control, we have to fight equally hard for the right to have children. I myself was sterilized when I was 23 years old by a doctor just didn't think I needed to have any more kids. That's the kind of reality that we live. And moreover, we have to fight for the right to parent the children that we have. Because children of color are so more frequently tracked out of schools into jails without even a phone call going to the parent just because they had an argument at school or they didn't, they weren't sufficiently respectful to the teacher. And so the right to have, the right not to have, the right to parent children made us come with a can come up with an analysis that we call reproductive justice. Now we're headquartered here in Atlanta, Georgia, largely because when they offered me the job I wouldn't move. <laughs> <laughs> but we are very proud to be here in Georgia and it's dark many national feminist organizations that can say they're headquartered in Georgia, so we're kind of singular in that respect. And a couple of years ago, we bought our own office building uh, that's called the Mother House, though we're in the West End. So we know we're the only feminists of color in the city of Atlanta that own our own office building. And I should just help me pass out postcards about our office building. I want to invite you to join Sister Song and if you, have, if you can, make a donation to support our office building. The way we see it, we spent 10 years creating spaces for women of color, and for the last two years, we now own the spaces we create. And so it's a huge transition for us. And in this building, we have HIV AIDS services, midwifery classes, uh, LGBT church services on Sunday. I mean, we have all these different activities that take place in the mother house. And we're very, very proud of them. And we're proud to say that feminism is alive and well south of I-20. That's the mother house. And so, I decided today to talk about the global women's human rights movement. And I'm really, really pleased that Agnes Scott has added a human rights minor to the curriculum. Why didn't y'all have that when I was here? <laughs> was it all those lectures I gave on human rights that really <laughs> helped that process? Anyway, and since for a long time, for about three decades, I've been part of the global women's human rights movement. And so I'm really glad that the Center for Women's Global Leadership is making the decision to participate in that group. Um, but I want to describe a few concepts that I'm going to be using frequently today. Oh, I'm sorry, I should tell you. I am at Emory getting my PhD because my plan is to come back to Agnes Scott and teach women's studies. <laughs> there is a method to this madness. I know y'all can't afford to hire anybody for a couple of years, but it's going to take me a couple of years to finish all that high theory anyway. <laughs> but there is a method.
method to this thing. I'm sad I'm being attached to this college for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm warning you now, so if you don't like me coming, you better start organizing. Because <laughs> I really plan on coming. But I offer that because I'm about to get a little lecturish. Unfortunately, that's what we teachers do. First, I'm going to describe why I call it a global women's movement. I think it's because of our reach and our impact. I mean, the very first rape crisis center was started in this country. No, the very first rape crisis center was started in the world in this country in 1972. Some of us are old enough to remember 1972. And it started with six women meeting in the home of a friend who decided that there were too many rapes in the District of Columbia and that there was no help for the women. And so this woman named Deb handed out her home phone number that allowed us to put it on posters so people could call to get help when they'd been assaulted. And from those six women has grown a global movement to end violence against women. We have 2,000 great crisis centers and domestic violence shelters in America. And you can multiply that exponentially around the world. There isn't a country in the world where women are not working to stop violence against women. And when you think of what those six women did, I wasn't one of those six, by the way. They hired me. But it really proves what Margaret Mead said, is that who said, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world because it's the only thing that does. Uh, and so we are truly a global women's <coughs> human rights group evidenced by our commitment to fight violence against women. And probably the second thing that we are most committed to is fighting for women's reproductive rights. There's also not a country in the world where women are committed to that struggle as well. And I'll come back to that. Now, why do I call it a human rights movement, not just a global women's movement? It's because it's based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And you cannot attend any international conference uh, of the women's movement and not be familiar with the basic discourse of human rights. Otherwise, people will look at you kind of pityingly and say, you're from America, aren't you? <laughs> you know? Because they recognize that in terms of understanding the basic human rights framework, we are 60 years behind the rest of the world. That have, been, that have been using this framework since it was first written in 1948. And yet it is not popularly taught in our high schools so that every child knows about it. Uh, I once asked uh, a representative of President Clinton at the State Department to put a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in every child's hands when he was trying to revise the educational system. I don't know if you remember goals 2000 and what he was trying to do with that. And uh, his representative politely said, I'm sorry, I appreciate what you're asking for, but it would violate, it, it, would, it would not be consistent with our policy agenda. <laughs> and it took me a while to decode the Washington speak, but this was 1996, and basically what she was saying was that they knew that they were getting ready to pass welfare reform and that the policies that they were then promoting would be in violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it didn't make sense for them to pass out the UDHR and at the same time promote policies that kick poor people off of welfare. And so I asked her, I said, are you telling me that President Clinton doesn't want people to know about their human rights? Because this is the year after Hillary had just come back from Beijing, by the way, proclaiming that women's rights are human rights. So, I thought I was on to something here. And she said, I said, you're saying President Clinton does not want us to pass out the UDHRs because it would violate welfare reform? And she said, well, I wouldn't put it that way. I said, don't worry about it, because I will. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be clear that's what you're saying. So anyway, that's why we don't know human rights. Because there's never been sufficient political will in this country to ensure that every American Yes, ma'am. Do you have any better hopes that that might be changing? I'm going to talk about that. Okay, great. Right. <laughs> That's the issue. Almost the five things we can do. 
Yes, I, yes, I do. And so, the first thing I need to say about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and those of you who've been in my human rights trainings and lectures before, forgive me for sounding a bit redundant, but you can never hear this stuff too much, actually, when you didn't know it for the majority of your life, is that it was written primarily by former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. It was written after the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, but based on earlier civil society and religious writings like the Bible and the Code of Hammurabi and Confucianism and the Enlightenment. I mean, a lot of ingredients went into the EDHR. And the reason that the Holocaust gave impetus to writing it, though, was that the world community through the United Nations recognized that what Nazi Germany did in its genocide against the Jews and the gypsies and the homosexuals and anybody else they didn't like, while it was immoral, it was not illegal. Because there's a distressing tendency of governments to legitimate immoral actions. Just like we legitimated the immorality of slavery. Governments do that. And so they decided to write a body of law that would put limits on what a government could do to its own people. And then spell out obligations that the government had to their people. Because it's important to remember that the Holocaust didn't begin with the genocide. It didn't begin with gas chambers. It began with discrimination policies, exclusion policies, refusal to educate, refusal to feed, refusal to even let people be buried with dignity. All of that began the Holocaust. So when we talk about genocide, it's the process, not simply the death that we're talking about. And human rights was put in place to prevent those processes from even being launched. So when you think of human rights, it is not about our ability to criticize what another country does. So we can do that. And the human rights movement, has, like Amnesty, has done a lot of that. But the original intent of human rights is to deal with your deal with your government. What does the government owe you? And what does the government have to keep from doing to you? Is the essence of human rights. So, unfortunately after the wonderful leadership we had on getting the world community to sign the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and December 10th is Human Rights Day because of that, the United States decided to go painfully slow in incorporating human rights into our laws and policies. So far, we have only ratified three of nearly 30 human rights treaties out there. And so we're seen as a rogue state in the human rights community. And then the treaties we ratified, we didn't mean. The first <laughs> treaty we ratified was the Convention on the Prevention of Genocide and Torture. <laughs> Do you think we made it? When you think about the difficulties in shutting down Guantanamo? Mm -hmm. Well, I have always been a believer in the mission of the UN and have a lot of faith in the United Nations and their agenda until I started doing work in City Soleil in Haiti. And what I saw there was peacekeepers violating black people's human rights and treating them much the same way that I've seen police here treat young black men on the street, right? So if the UN themselves, not to mention the children are leaving behind, the sexual abuse has been committing against underage women, you know, all of the different issues that the UN is actually bringing to bear on the Haitian people, how is it that you're supposed to adhere to the Declaration on Human Rights when the people who are invested with the responsibility to protect that are actually violating people's human rights? Because I, I have pictures of that, and I have a real problem with the fact that that's happening. I totally agree that that happens. It happens in situations of civil unrest, conflict, war, and UN peacekeepers have been accused of a lot of sexual violence of women towards women and children. The problem is that while they have the authority, the United States has never put its money or, 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 or money and resources behind it to actually give the peacekeepers any real power or to hold them accountable. Matter of fact, we have a distaste 
for holding anybody in a uniform accountable for anything. I mean, look what's happening in Iraq with the death of civilians or the rape of women in the military by other military forces, and people are getting away with it. I mean, well, I guess I hold the UN itself as a body responsible for that because you're, but the you're UN is only as strong as the member states make it, and when the strongest member state undermines it instead of supporting it, it, it can't it can't overcome that by itself. That's why we as Americans have such a huge responsibility to take the responsibility towards the international community more seriously. That's really where the dilemma is. Uh, we have supreme veto power at the UN. Anything we don't like, we can lock, we can underfund, we refuse to, refuse to fully fund the UN as, as part of our treaty obligations for the last 30 years. Uh, we are a bully, basically, nation when it comes to human rights. We invoke them when we want to whip another country into right. behavior. Well, like take something they have. Take something they have. Okay. But we are not seen as being willing to fight for human rights when our economic interests are not at stake. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of sad, I think. You know, I like to think that I live in the best country in the world. And I expect more of the best country in the world, myself. So, you're absolutely right. So, it probably would take a whole hour to fully respond to your question of why the United States has not responded or upheld this human rights bargain. But that would be a whole other lecture, and y'all want to hear that. So now I'm going to talk about what are human rights. Let's see if this works. It did work. I went too fast. Can you see that? Because I can't. Anyway. In the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, or the UDHR as we call it, they spelled out first five categories of human rights protections to which we are all entitled. And I don't have the time to give a full lecture on that, so I'm going to run through them really, really fast because I have to speak at that New York speed. Civil rights, the right to be free from discrimination, the right to achieve equality. Political human rights, which is like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the right to vote, but we recently learned that we don't have the right to have our votes counted. A small problem there. Economic human rights, the right to a living wage, the right for workers to organize. My favorite economic human rights is the right to rest and leisure. Don't get enough of that. Social human rights are those human rights born out of your human needs. So food, shelter, clothing, medical care, and this is something that is always controversial when I said on the college campus, the right to education is actually a human right. And that's going to challenge the financial arrangements of all of our institutions if we ever take that one seriously. And then there are cultural human rights. That's the right to practice the culture of your choice, the religion of one's choice. It's also the freedom to not have someone else's religion imposed upon you. So a lot of these debates around morality that we're having in our society vis-a-vis -vis women's rights are really about people's attempt to impose their religious values on all of us. There's freedom of religion and there's freedom from religion as a cultural human right. The right to speak the language of your choice, to receive services in the language of your need. Every time you print a brochure in Spanish or French or Swahili, you're actually a human rights defender. Did you know that? If you do so in the United States. After the UDHR was written, new categories of rights were added. Because in 1948, nobody really realized that the right to a clean environment might be important. <laughs> you know, clean water, non-toxic neighborhoods, non-genetically modified foods, clean air. <clears throat> so environmental human rights developed. Development of human rights developed because those countries we call the developing world began to demand to control their own natural resources. What a novel thought that is. <laughs> so some of us would argue that our war against I Iraq is in violation of their developmental human rights because we can't explain how our oil got under their sand. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
because they're white male. No one's going to say that. And so we just have a whole patchwork of discrimination. I don't have time to go through it. But we do have a new opportunity presented by the Obama administration with the appointment, get to your question, of Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. She's voiced strong support for women's human rights. And so there's a real possibility that CEDAW will be voted out of the Senate Judiciary Committee during the uh, first Obama administration. Obama has also asked Senator Barbara Boxer to chair the newly created, never been before created, got to get this right, Foreign Relations Subcommittee of International Operations, Organizations, Human Rights, Democracy, and Global Women's Issues. What a title. <laughs> but this is the first time that such a high level position has been created to bring attention to women's human rights. So there are some real interesting things happening right now that make us feel very optimistic. So the second thing we need to do at Agnes Scott is make sure we teach this knowledge to our community. That there's a lot of exciting politics happening right now. And we don't want to be behind <laughs> everything. We don't, we don't want to fail to have these conversations with, 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 with Secretary Clinton and, and, and Senator Boxer and, and, and all the people who are now on her subcommittee trying to push women's human rights. Third, I think we have a chance to engage our community on international issues that affect women internationally and here in the U.S. Uh, the issue I bring attention to for Atlanta is the issue of trafficking in women, which not only is taking place abroad, but young women are being kidnapped out of our own neighborhoods here in Atlanta and forced into prostitution or agricultural production right here in our state. So we have a chance to be the victim's voice for people who are trafficked and having their human rights violated. Fourth, we must engage in the global conversation about protecting women's bodies and our right to self-determination. President Obama also lifted the global gag rule, which prohibited federal funds or international aid funds from being used uh, in countries and in clinics where people even talked about abortion, much less provided any services. And so he lifted the global bag rule, which ironically created the situation that women internationally now have more rights than we have again. Because we have here in the U.S. the Hyde Amendment that prohibits the use of federal funds uh, to pay for abortions for women who get their health care from the government. Not only does it include women on Medicaid, but it includes women in the military, women in the Peace Corps, women on Indian reservations. So a woman in the military has less access to information on abortion than a woman in Iraq. Isn't that an irony? We've got to correct that situation. It's just wrong. And I know that I'm talking about abortion is a sensitive topic, and people are on both sides of the issue. This is not necessarily to persuade people to change their mind. But the real question is whether or not women have the right to decide for themselves what to do with their bodies. And don't U.S. women deserve the same rights that are enjoyed by women in 61 other countries? Yeah. Um, speaking of that, um, I read a book recently um, based on the Muslim culture. Can you tell me if anything is going on About on that? What culture? The Muslim yeah. culture, is Islamic culture. Is anything going on on the global front may have changed some of the women's rights over there? Yeah, let's be clear. When you talk about Muslim countries, there's a whole range of Muslim countries. And so we have a stereotype that everybody's in Perda and locked down and can't go to school and blah, blah, blah. There, you actually have to specify which country. Saudi because Arabia would be you know, one. There, there are Muslim countries that allow considerable uh, uh, freedom for women and support women's human rights. And there are Muslim countries that do not. <laughs> OK, and so there are a lot of organizations here in the US, though, that work on behalf of Muslim women. And if you contact me after the presentation, I'd be happy to share my card with you and network you with those groups that are doing work. There are usually women from Muslim countries working on behalf of women in their country. Like there's one group called Women, women for Women Living Under Muslim Laws. Mm -hmm. that I about. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. This same debate, by the way, has affected the economic stimulus bill in Washington. 
because if you notice, the first thing they jettisoned out of the bill in there in the bipartisan negotiation was covering birth control <laughs> on Medicaid for poor women. The second thing they kicked out was money for Head Start. And I don't understand how then education became the third thing on the cutting block. So with 42% of the unemployed people right now being women, how in the world are women supposed to lift themselves out of this desperate situation if they have no access to birth control, if they have no access to Head Start, early childhood care, uh, child care, and no access to education? And then the Wall Street Journal had nerve to write on January 27 that they thought those cuts were a good idea because women needed more babies to stimulate the economy. <laughs> and I swear, these men are thinking in 19th century terms. And when you say the word stimulus, obviously the wrong body part is stimulating. <laughs> 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 women to have more babies to rescue okay. the economy, obviously they've never raised a child. <laughs> and see how expensive that is. So anyway, moving on. Fifth, <laughs> the Agnes Scott community through the Center for Women's Global Leadership must learn about participate in the global women's movement. I know, you're coming back to jerk me down, okay. <laughs> By attending our conferences, joining our struggles at the United Nations, because they are fierce, by the way. There are forces determined to roll women's rights back to their 1970s level. <coughs> and the voices of American women are not there in that struggle in the ways that it should be. And to go to international women's health conferences, internet, there's a big uh, world conference for women in Sofia, Bulgaria in 2010 that a lot of us are going to. I mean, there's hundreds of opportunities like that. And so I think I hate to say this in this time of economic hardship, but you may need a big travel budget if you really want to participate in, this, in, in, in the global women's movement. But you also have the opportunity to bring representatives from that movement here to share what they know. Instead of us being the missionaries going over there, we need missionaries coming over here to teach us what we've not known for the last 60 years about the global women's movement. So in closing, I get to my last slide, on some of the five things I said we need to do. Because we've got to teach about human rights education, we've got to learn about women's human rights leadership, we've got to engage in international campaigns like trafficking, reproductive rights, and protecting women's reproductive freedom, and we've got to participate in that movement. And so, I'd really like us to have long and deep conversations about what it will mean to our community if we say we're embracing a Center for Women's Global Leadership and the Human Rights Framework. Because this commitment has tremendous transformational potential that will benefit this institution in many ways I can't even begin to imagine. It will be analogous to how Dr. King embraced the Human Rights Framework. Because you may remember that he moved from civil rights to human rights. And in his last Sunday sermon, March 31st, 1968, he called on us to build a human rights movement in this country. And so I'm really glad that Agnes Scott is seizing this moment to join that call. Thank you all.
Stephanie got the first one. Cool. Cool. Good people. That's great. Loretta, we, we are honored to present this award, Vision Award, to you. And we are doing so in recognition of your work to address social injustices through human rights education and your activism to promote women's reproductive rights and to empower women diagnosed with HIV AIDS and for your steadfast efforts to stop violence against women worldwide for your role as founder and executive director of the National Center for Human Rights Education and as co-founder for Sister Love, a reproductive justice organization for women with a focus on HIV AIDS and Sister Song, Women of Color Health Collective. Oh I understand Violet's point, there's so much to say. <laughs> for your writing projects that bring attention to issues affecting women of color and for promoting feminist leadership in all spheres. Oh. Congratulations.